Good morning, everyone. We're back after a three-week hiatus. Hope you all rested. Breaking my heart when I see you in sorrow. You feel with despair all the time, no hope for tomorrow. Fearing the future ahead, so lost in confusion. I'll seem so lost to you now, but there's a solution. Don't be in heaven the one who gave his son for you and I pour out your troubles and don't worry tell him what you need and give him thanks then the peace of God beyond human conception will guide your hearts and your mind from Satan's deception Obeying the word of the Son Living a life that's new So celebrate, don't hesitate It's waiting to hear from you Anytime, any day That's what I say All oh, pray to your Father Who's in heaven one who gave his son for you and I Pour out your troubles and don't worry Tell him what you need and give him thanks God, to ignore him is such a crime. You have been loved and loved and will be for the rest of time. Why live in fear every day when your father is on your side? The death of his son showed his love, his loving arms are now open wide. Run to him now, he'll help you somehow. Pray to your Father who's in heaven The one who gave his son for you and I Pour out your troubles and don't worry Tell him what you need and give him back Tab right back. All right, uh, good morning, and uh, again, and uh, we're back uh, after a three-week hiatus, as I said before the song, and it's good to be back. It's, uh, it, you know, you have a, a certain routine that uh, that you uh, have and a certain rhythm you have when, you, when, you, when I'm, you're doing what I'm doing, 
And uh, so it's kind of weird to get back into it again, you know. But I uh, got a lot, I think I got a lot done. I didn't write a new, <laughs> I wanted to finish off a song I'd, I've had sitting around. You just need the lyrics and the melody. I didn't do it, but uh, I'll get it done. I, I get that collection of 14 songs I'm trying to do. I do it every so often. But um, anyway, so that's, uh, we, it was a good uh, break for me. And as, and as I was telling you before we went on the break, I, it wasn't like I was uh, on vacation. I was actually working. I was it, uh, one of the, when you do when you teach as much as I do six times a week, three times for Winston Bible Ministries, Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays, and then with Doctrinal Bible Churches, which is the reason why I'm down here in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, I'm the pastor there, and I teach on Wednesday evenings and also uh, two two uh, hour long sessions on Sunday mornings, and so uh, there's a lot of preparation for that. So. Um, I like to keep ahead, like right now I'm working on Ephesians, which I'm teaching you, but I like to stay, you know, three, four, five months if I can ahead of when I'm going to teach these classes. So I like to be much prepared well in advance. And I've learned that, a lot. I did that from the very beginning. I've learned from other people of what not to do. And I don't believe in cramming. It doesn't help you people. It doesn't help you. And it doesn't, it's not honoring God's word. Uh, so, um, so I do, I did some, uh, I caught up some on, um, did some writing stuff. Uh, you know, I'm always updating or writing new documents uh, that go to our Webster.org page or Academy Edu. So uh, I'm doing that and then catching up on, as I said, on some reading. And uh, what else did I do? I think uh, I didn't play too much music. I, 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 did, I might have sang one day on the porch or something. I can't remember. But get my workout routine going. I've been up in the morning. I get back into uh, uh, doing my uh, little bit of workout in the morning. And then I, I take a two-mile two, uh, two walk. Uh, pretty much every day, not every single day, because if it rains, I'm not ra- walking in the rain. Although maybe I might someday in barefooted in the rain. You never know, singing in the rain. So uh, um, you know, it was, it was a good, it was a good break. And so I'm going to be doing this every couple months for Winston Bob Mysteries, just just because if you don't do that, if you teach as much as I do, you can get uh, you can get overrun, and uh, I want I, I don't want to get bu- um, uh, burnt out or worn worn out. Uh, the teaching is actually easy. It's the preparation. And then, just, you know, you got other stuff that goes on and people don't see in the ministry, people issues, people talk const- constantly. Somebody's going to call you or text you or, you know, there's always something going on, questions or whatever. So, and then I have the a group here in, 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 uh, in, in, in Huntsville and uh, it's, uh, uh, they're great. And it's, uh, so it's, uh, it's, but it is, you know, you, you now you have more people you're overseeing. So, and uh, I got a good, great group of deacons over here at Dr. Bible Church. Thank God. And uh, what else? Uh, my brother Jimmy's birthday is today, so I know he's not watching me. <laughs> well, happy birthday, James, if you are. And uh, so I texted him, but uh, he's 60 years old. That is really, really old, 60 years old. And, uh, of course, I'm the oldest in the family, so I'm being sarcastic. And what else? Uh, for those who might be new to the ministry, I like to do this from time to time, especially if we're getting back. Uh, Western Bible Ministries, um, we're uh, an expository-type ministry. That means we go through the different books of the book, books of the Bible, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph. We alternate between Old Testament and New Testament. In between in between books, I do um, the various doctrines of the Christian faith, and our all our classes are recorded uh, live uh, through YouTube. We have a streaming video by YouTube. We're live right now, and also we uh, we got a. Uh, uh, our MP3, MP4s, our video and audio are put up on our Winstrom.org site and also log our sermons. Uh, if you Google me or you can go to Winstrom.org and on the homepage, you can go right to those, uh, you can go uh, right to that um, log our sermon site from the homepage. Uh, also, the classes that we record audio at, at Doctrinal Bible Church are also put up on our log our sermons website. Um, we're going to be having video there soon where the guy, Paul over there who takes care of our audio visual stuff he's he's working on doing that so it looks pretty good so eventually we'll have the video for uh, doctrinal bible church and also i've overwritten i've written and they're in pdf format i've written over 1700 written articles um in our uh, in various subjects of the christian faith the doctrines of the christian faith it's set up in uh various uh, aspects of systematic systematic theology and also we have the exegesis and exposition of all the studies we've done over the last 30 years here at winston.org in exhaustive detail if you check them out and then uh, we also have different uh, prep school materials for kids, uh, prep school teachers that's used, Greek word studies even, and, uh, and also different uh, people in the Bible, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Paul, and, and uh, I have written articles on. And, uh, and the, over 700 written articles of ours are put up on Academia EDU, 
And it's really good about that is they got great analytics over there. So we're in, I guess we're in the, since we, since 2017, we've been up there. And amazingly, we're in the top 1% of people who view our material, uh, you know, that view material on Academia E. We're in the top 1%. We have, uh, nine, as I, they said, uh, 913,000 views. And we have like almost 5,000 followers. And uh, that's since 2017. So that that's quite a surprise. I, I didn't, I wasn't even going to, as I said in the past, I didn't even know if anybody would even look at my stuff. So I guess it's going well. So I'm thankful for it. And I got a lot of great feedback from people. Um, and also, um, I had also on, on our break, I had a great, uh, a great, uh, somebody contacted me on, through a phone call from India and his name's, uh, Alan, great, great guy, believer. And he was just, uh, uh, expressing his gratitude for the teaching. And he was listening to some of my stuff at Prairie View that I did in my first church plant in Iowa in 2007, eight, around that period, he was listening to Genesis and Romans and uh, that we did there. And uh, so what a great conversation. It was like, an hour, we had an hour long con conversation. We'll, we'll get together, uh, we'll talk again uh, in, in the next couple of weeks, maybe another week or two, because he called me right at the beginning of the break. So yeah, it was a great encouragement. And uh, there was some other nice things that uh, people wrote me uh, on the break. So that was good. So. Nice to get in. Uh, nice to get uh, uh, hear feed, feedback on what your uh, your material and what you're doing, and see that it's helping people. Because that's what my gift is for: is to help the body of Christ. Um, also, uh, I, I I write my own Christian music. For those who don't know, uh, we put that on our Webster.org page. Uh, we also do. We also have a YouTube page, and we have playlists for all the things we've done since 2011, since we've been on YouTube. And so that's the different books that we've done, the different doctrine subjects we've done, and also the music I've done. So I usually write, when I write my own Christian music, it's, I, I usually write a collection of 14 songs. So the last one I did was before I left for Massachusetts in 2018 when I was in Iowa. It's called Rejoice. It's on our website. And uh, and it's in the, uh, the hits of the song, on the songs are in the thousands now. Like I'm talking almost, ten, like one song I have is, which is hysterical. It's a song I don't even really like that much musically. It's called Filthy Rags. It's got over 10,000 hits on this song. And I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe it's the title or something. Uh, but anyways, uh, yeah, so it, it, that's pretty funny. But I'm actually in the process of writing a new collection of 14 songs. I got three done already. There's one song that was dedicated to my, fr uh, my brother, Kenny, who passed away uh, back in November of 2022. And then I had uh, another friend of mine who passed away. Uh, in 2019, Tyler Thompson, and uh, he, uh, when I was in Iowa, so I wrote a song dedicated to him and my relationship with those two, and uh, from the Christian perspective, of course. And then I, I uh, one of the other ones I'd done already, I, that song I finally uh, wrote lyrics and a melody to, and I really like it. Um, uh, the, it's called The Four Dimensions of Christ's Love, so... And uh, and then I'm working on this other one. I really like the music and the range, and so I'm looking to write lyrics and melody to that, so we'll see what happens with that. Hopefully I'll, I'll be able to uh, pull that off in the near future and uh, what else do we uh, we have um, so our main website is Winston.org. Um, there's Logos Sermons and again you can access that you can Google us you'll see that also Academy Edu website you can you can Google us or my name and Winston Bible Ministries or Bill Winston and you'll see it um, we also have um, a podcast on iTunes Spotify Amazon Music just search for us under Winston Bible Ministries and the classes from Doctrinal Bible Church that we teach over here in Huntsville uh, are up there as well. Uh, also, if you're interested in, and you're, like, you're in the Huntsville, uh, Alabama area, it's a great area. It's, I had a, last night I was having a cigar and some uh, uh, a drink with some people, and uh, what a night! I had a great night. It was a lot of cool people uh, in there in the place I go to uh, from time to time, and uh, so it's a great town. And uh, it's the heart of the military industrial complex. I've met I've, I've met uh, Pentagon general uh, people generals engineers galore of all types and uh, just a great place uh, fantastic place to, to, to live and I'm really happy and blessed to be here um, but uh, we're at uh, for Doctrinal Bible Church we're at 1215 Russell Street Northeast that's in Huntsville Alabama and uh, our classes times over there are on Wednesday evenings at 6 30 p.m. so if you're in the area which 6 30 p.m. and also Sunday mornings at 9 30 we have two sessions after the first session, we take a break. It's usually about each class is usually about an hour, and uh, we we observe the Lord's Supper the first Sunday of each month. Although this month over there, uh, we'll be uh, looking at the um, we'll be doing that 
Blood Supper at Dr. Bible Church at the end, last Sunday of the month, because last Sunday of the month is Easter. So, um, and for, um, and went to Bible Ministries, we teach Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays, 11 a.m. Central Standard Time, as you can see on the board for those who have the video. And uh, so, uh, if you're, uh, if you also like to contribute to the ministry, you can, uh, some people write us a check uh, made out to Winston Bible Ministries. Our address, as you can see on the board for those who have the video, is 603 O'Shaughnessy Avenue, Northeast, Huntsville, Alabama, 35801. If you go to the website, you'll see that address too. Uh, it's this, uh, so then um, also, um, what else I have to say? Oh, you, if you want to give through, uh, you can get through PayPal on the homepage at Winston.org. You click on the donate tab and you can uh, uh, donate through PayPal. Whatever works for you will work for me. And uh, so uh, that's about it for um, the announcements. So let's get right to it. We're going to start a new chapter uh, here in Ephesians today. We're in the third chapter today. And today, as you can see on the board, for those who do have the video, we're going to be looking, uh, the, so this will be the first of three hours in Ephesians 3.1. Today we'll be looking at the basis for Paul's second intercessory prayer on behalf of the Gentile Christians. And this will constitute um, the 131st hour in Ephesians. So without further ado, let's take a moment of silent prayer, as is our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to determine if we're in fellowship with God. Because any mental, verbal, or overactive sin we'll know that we knowingly commit will cause us to lose fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to the Father, He, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. And we maintain our fellowship by obeying the Spirit who speaks to us through the Scriptures which He's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit. And Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. So if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5.7 says. Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, another day to study your word. We thank you for the grace, the faith, the salvation, your work on our behalf in eternity past, the personal work of your Son of the Cross, and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, from regeneration to resurrection. Thank you, Father, for those who might be joining us live now uh, through uh, the, the various, um, through the website, streaming video by YouTube. Thank you for that service. I pray it would function properly. Uh, and thank you, for uh, that, again, for the service that they provide and the people taking advantage of it. I also um, thank you for those who might be watching or listening to these classes at a later date to our various websites, podcasts, and media platforms that you've given to us. I pray today that you'd help your children in the audience to learn, understand, and apply accurately what they're being taught to concentrate. And please break down any barrier that uh, sin and Satan might uh, put up that would hinder that from happening. So I pray by the Spirit would do a mighty work through them and doing that. And also by the power of the Spirit, I pray you would enable me to deliver your full counsel today as we begin a new study in Ephesians 3. Uh, today, Father, and I just pray that you would bless us in this study and help me to communicate this uh, this uh, chapter and this verse today, Ephesians 3, 1, with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power, so that your people uh, could see, receive their necessary spiritual nourishment, because your word, word has taught us that man, human beings, do not live on bread alone, but from every word that proceeds out of your mouth. And I also pray, Father, for the technology. I thank you for it again, that people take advantage of it. I pray there be no problems with the rec recordings, the video, and the audio. And he uploaded these things to our various websites, podcasts, and media platforms that you've given to us. Protect them from the enemy as you've done. Continue to do so and use them mightily as you've done so far. I pray you continue to do so as well. And if there's any uh, people in the audience that are not yet Christians and they're, they're just uh, interested or they're uh, searching or they're going through a crisis or whatever their reasons for being here, we thank you for them as well. And I pray at some point the Holy Spirit help them to understand the gospel of your son Jesus Christ so that they can make a decision to accept or reject your son, Jesus Christ, and as Savior, we know that you desire all people to be saved from your wrath and uh, to come to an experiential knowledge of the truth 
who is Jesus. So we pray for this service in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. All right, as I said before the opening prayer, we're going to be uh, begin today a start of a new chapter, Ephesians chapter 3. And uh, and, and also uh, we'll do this by uh, noting the first of three hours in Ephesians 3, 1. Now, uh, sometimes people wonder why you take so long to get to one verse sometimes. Well, especially when you see me do an epistle, uh, like for instance, Paul. Uh, he, there are many things that Paul might say in, in one verse. And so depending on the content of the verse... Uh, will determine that'll determine how long I stay on a verse and, and how long it takes me to explain it to you everything that's going on in the verse and uh, and, and also pr explain the application and uh, we also see that uh, if you notice me when I've done books like Genesis or Exodus uh, where there are narratives I take big uh, I'll take a chapter sometimes and when I was doing the beginning of Exodus I would take a full chapter for one on one's class so depending on the type of literature I'm studying or the type of narrative, if it's a narrative or whatever it is, or epistle, it'll determine how long I'm going to stay. The content's going to determine how long I stay in that verse. And uh, so we're going to go and uh, look at uh, today in Ephesians 3.1, as you can see on the board, we're going to study the basis for Paul's second intercessory prayer on behalf of the recipients of this letter who were Gentile Christians in the Roman province of Asia. And this is, again, the second of two intercessory prayers, as, we'll, as we pointed out when we looked at the first one in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Uh, the second one here uh, is, like the first one, is a hinge. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about what that means. There's two hinges in this particular book. Now, uh, for those who might be new to this study, and there's always people who are new coming into the studies because through the, the websites or whatever, YouTube, there's always new people. So, uh, for some of you, it might be uh, a, um, a repetition, but a lot of times uh, people forget things, so it's good for repetition. Uh, so by way of review, quickly, uh, the Ephesian epistles actually was not written directly, specifically for the Ephesian Christian community. It was actually a circular letter that was written for the various Christian communities throughout the Roman province of Asia, which is now known as Turkey. Uh, we see that uh, we know this, uh, first and foremost, because of, in the manuscript tradition, the oldest and best manuscripts, Greek manuscripts of this particular epistle, uh, they do not contain the word Ephesus. That's not to say the word Ephesus is not in Ephesians 1.1. It is in, the, in many manuscripts, but the oldest and best don't have it. And, uh, and also, there's no personal greetings in the letter. We would expect Paul... Uh, to because he was there in Ephesus for three years, Ephesians 18, 19, and 20 tell us that. So you would expect him to have give uh, present uh, personal greetings to people uh, because he was familiar with the Ephesian Christian community, but he doesn't do that. And uh, so based upon the first factor with the manuscript tradition, the oldest and best manuscripts don't have Ephesians, and also that, and also we see that a man named Martian, uh, and actually was a heretic in the early centuries of the church, he saw this letter, and it was at read out to the Laodiceans. What's interesting about that is the same content, the thing we call Ephesians today, he saw it, and he said it was addressed to the Laodiceans, which corresponds, we believe, many scholars, and I'm one of those pastors that believe that, that uh, in the Colossians chapter 4, at the end of that book, Paul talks about the Colossians reading the Laodicean letter, the letter he sent to the Laodiceans, which many people believe that is what we call Ephesians. So this, as we saw in our introduction, is a circular letter written to the various Christian communities throughout the Roman province of Asia, in particular Gentiles. Ephesians 2.11, as we saw, point out to us that he's writing to Gentiles. And uh, the, the, Paul is the author of this letter, we pointed out. Uh, there are some people who believe that he wasn't the author. That's uh, like the pastoral epistles. Uh, many now are starting to believe in the Christian circles and scholarly circles in Christianity. Uh, that uh, Paul was, uh, it was a pseudonymous letter, meaning somebody posing as Paul who revered Paul uh, was posing as Paul and writing this letter. And that, I say, is emphatically can be rejected. Paul didn't, and the early church didn't accept pseudonymous letters. Uh, in fact, they were trying to prevent against forgeries all the time when we studied Second Thessalonians. Uh, he says in chapter 2 of that book that uh, he, he didn't want them to believe that the day of the Lord took in place, e taken place even if somebody says they were writing, for, that's him that's writing. Uh, he, and he gives his authenticating mark at the end of that book, saying, "This is my, this is my signature here that, that, that makes sure that this is uh, authentic and it's mine." So that tells you he didn't accept pseudonymous writings. 
nobody posing on his behalf. In fact, early church history, a man named Irenaeus, on, in his work on, on baptism, it's called. He says they threw a pastor out of the, out of the, out of the pulpit because uh, disciplined him because he was posing as Paul, not because he was sinister in what he was doing. He actually revered Paul and wanted to increase his fame, and so he po was posing as Paul when he wrote uh, a letter to a church, and the church threw him out of the pulpit So as, as church discipline. And so they did not accept it. And the purpose of this letter is, uh, and we, you know, we talk about this is written to Gentile Christians. The purpose of this letter is actually uh, to maintain unity experientially in the Christian community. And he's thinking about the Jews and Gentile wing of the churches getting along. Uh, Paul even alludes to this in Romans uh, 14 and 15, uh, in particular 14 with the dietary regulations. Uh, so he wanted the Jewish and Gentile Christians uh, to continue to have uh, ex uh, experience unity and uh, he wants, it, and they already had that unity, as we pointed out in Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 22, because uh, they had that at, at, at justification through the baptism of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit uh, identifies whether they're a Jewish or Gentile believer, male or female, slave or free. They the Holy Spirit identifies them with Jesus Christ and his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session of the right hand of the Father. So both Jewish and Gentile Christians, Paul says in Ephesians 2, are the new humanity. And the importance of that is that uh, the new humanity is the bride of Christ, Ephesians chapter 5. And we know that Christ comes back at, with his church at the second advent, uh, and as it says in Revelation 19, to establish the kingdom of God on earth. At that time, at the second advent, Christ he comes back with the church to deliver Israel from the tribulational armies, Satan and the fallen angels. And uh, he comes back with the church also in resurrection bodies, but, but also elect angels and tribulational martyrs and Old Testament saints in resurrection bodies to start the kingdom. So you and I, the bride of Christ, with Jewish believers in the church age, are the bride of Christ and the new humanity that's going to dispossess Satan and the fallen angels when, at the second advent. Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, don't you know that you're going to judge angels? And so you are in a, a position higher than the elect angels, the fallen angels of Satan, the churches. And what a tragedy that believers are not being taught of their union and identification with Jesus Christ through the baptism of the Spirit at the moment of justification. You are somebody, one, because you create in the image of God, two, you're now in the image of Christ. You're in the, under the headship of Christ. You're not under a curse. You're under a place of blessing. You have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because of that union identification with Christ. We saw that in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, which served as the basis for the first intercessory prayer in the letter. Now in Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 22, as we'll see, is the basis, the discussion about Jew and Gentile church age believers are the new humanity and uh, the temple of God. Uh, that's going to serve, as we'll see, as the basis for the second intercessory prayer that we're going to begin to study in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. And so, uh, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to the end of the chapter. That's where the intercessory prayer is. And so, it's interesting also, as we'll see, the first 13 verses of Ephesians chapter 3 are actually not the basis for this prayer uh, in verses 14 through uh, the end of the chapter in Ephesians 3, but actually uh, it's a digression which is quite interesting. And it talks about the mystery, the mystery that Jewish and Gentile believers are co-heirs, co-partakers uh, of, of the promise, of Messianic promise, and co-members of the body of Christ through their faith in Jesus Christ, the justification and union and identification with him through the baptism of the Spirit at justification. So this is an interesting uh, class that we have today because we want to nail down that the fact that the, the verses 11 through 22 of chapter 2 of Ephesians are the basis for the intercessory prayer that Paul communicates in Ephesians 3, 14 to the end of the chapter. And so, uh, and then we have that great autobiographical digression of Paul's stewardship of this mystery of Jew and Gentile believers being co-heirs and co-partakers of the Messianic promise and co-members of the body of Christ. So this is exciting stuff in Ephesians that we're seeing. So without further ado, let's look at Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to read from the Net Bible and then... I'll read from my translation of the first three, 13 verses. We'll read Ephesians 3, 1 through 13. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's read the whole chapter. We'll do that. How's that? We'll do the whole chapter, and then we'll do, uh, we'll read it, this whole chapter in my translation. Actually, we'll just, we won't do it in my translation. We'll just do, uh, 
the first 13 verses because that's what we're going to start looking at today. So let's read the whole chapter in Ephesians chapter 3 and uh, then we'll look, be looking at verse 1 in detail or start to the first of three hours. So it says in Ephesians 3, 1, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, that by revelation, the divine secret was made known to me as I wrote before briefly. When reading this, you'll be able to understand my insight into this secret of Christ. Now this secret was not disclosed to people in former generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Namely, that through the gospel, the Gentiles, our fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. That's who you are as a Christian today, people. That's a church-age believer. That's you. I became a servant of this gospel according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the exercise of his power. To me, less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given to proclaim to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten everyone about God's secret plan, a secret that has been hidden for ages in God who has created all things. The purpose of this enlightenment is that through the church, the multifaceted wisdom of God should now be disclosed to the rules and authorities in the heavenly realms. This was according to the eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access to God because of Christ's faithfulness. For this reason, I ask you not to lose heart because of what I'm suffering for you, which is for your glory. And he was in uh, under house arrest in Rome, awaiting his appeal before Caesar and approximately six, between 60 and 62 AD. It's his first Roman imprisonment, and he was released from it. So then he says in verse 14, For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that according to the wealth of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner person, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, so that because you've been rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and thus to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. Now, to him who by the power that is working within us is able to do far beyond all that we ask or think, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So that is chapter 3 of Ephesians, which closes the indicatives of this book with the imperatives coming in verses 4, uh, chapters 4 through 6. But if you notice in Ephesians 3, 1, you have at the beginning, it says, for this reason, and then in verse 14, for this reason, and it's the same uh, phrase as we'll see. And uh, so we basically, as we'll see, verses 1 through 13 are actually parenthetical, a digression to develop uh, a discussion of Paul, Paul's stewardship on behalf of the Gentile Christian community, to communicate to them the, the mystery, the secret, the divine secret, that Gentile believers are now co-heirs, co-members of the body of Christ, and co-partakers of the Messianic promise with Jewish believers because of their faith in Jesus Christ, the justification and union and identification with Him. So, uh, that, uh, so verse 14 uh, resumes basically the thought that begins in verse one, and it's indicated by the fact that this word phrase for this reason, which is found in verse one, is repeated in verse fourteen. So in other words, he starts the prayer up. He kind of he 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 was going to start the prayer, but then he interjected something for thirteen verses, and then he decides to resume the prayer, and uh, in verse fourteen and get to the content. And it's not because he was you know uh, long uh, what do you call it uh, lost his tra train of thought. He actually was a brilliant mind, and he was using actually a figure called Anna Caluthon, which he did already in this book, because he had such an incredible mind, and he was a genius uh, in the natural realm, I believe. But when you give him the Holy Spirit, wow, he's something else, and <laughs> that's what he was. So, uh, look, uh, if you look at uh, my translation, let's, let's look at my translation of the first 13 verses, and before we look at, uh, dig into verse 1, and that phrase, for this reason. So look at Ephesians 3 1 in my translation.
For this reason, I myself, Paul, the prisoner owned by and under the authority of the one and only Christ, who is Jesus, for the benefit of each and every one of you as a corporate unit with Gentiles. If, and let us assume it's true for the sake of argument, the, each and every one of you, as a corporate unit, have surely heard about the stewardship, which is unique to the grace which originates from the one and only God, which was given to me for the benefit of all of you as a corporate unit without exception. Of course, every one of you, in fact, have heard about it. Then he says in verse 3, namely, that the mystery was made known for the benefit of myself as a revelation, as I wrote beforehand in a concise manner, concerning which, that is, by each of you making it your habit of hearing read publicly, all of you will, for your own benefit, become able to comprehend my insight into this incomparable mystery, which is produced by your unique union and identification with Christ. This mystery was by no means made known to members of the human race and previous generations, as it has now been revealed through the personal agency of his holy apostles, as well as prophets, by means of the omnipotence of the Spirit. Namely, that the Gentiles, our fellow heirs, as well as fellow members of the body, likewise fellow partakers of the promise, because of justification by faith in, and union and identification with Christ Jesus, by means of the proclamation of the gospel. I assumed the opposition and responsibility of serving this gospel according to the gift originating from the one and only God's grace, which was given to me according to the activity produced by the exercise of his power. To me, the less than least of all the saints, this grace was given in order to proclaim for my benefit to the Gentiles the unfathomable wealth brought about by this justification by faith in and union and identification with Christ. Specifically, in order to cause each and every one of you to be enlightened as to what constitutes this unique dispensation, which is a mystery, which has been hidden from previous ages because of God's will, who has caused each and every animate and inanimate object to be created. Consequently, the multifaceted wisdom produced by the manifestation of the will of the Father was made known to the sovereign rulers and governmental authorities in the heavenlies through the members of the church. This was in conformity with the eternal predetermined plan which he caused to be accomplished by means of our faith in and union and identification with the one and only Christ, who is Jesus, who is the one and only Lord ruling over each and every one of us as a corporate unit. On the basis of our faith in and union and identification with him, each and every one of us are experiencing boldness, namely access with confidence to the presence of the Father by means of his faithfulness. Therefore, I myself urgently request at the present time that each and every one of you as a corporate unit not be discouraged because of my adversities on behalf of all of you without exception, which are unique in character, making possible for each and every one of you to receive honor. What a great, great, great section of Ephesians that we have here. So we today in our first uh, hour in Ephesians 3.1, we're going to discuss, as I said in brief, the, 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 the two phrases, one in verse 3, first one in verse 14, and the, and the beginning of verse 14, and the one that's in the beginning of verse 1. For this reason, which uh, in, the, in the Greek text is tutu harin, which is, uh, and there's the Greek here on the board, and uh, that shows up in verse 1, at the beginning of verse 1, and the beginning of verse uh, 14, and it's translated correctly, for this reason. And what do we need to interpret about? Well, we have to figure out is it referring to what's to come, verses uh, 2 through 13, or is it talking about what's already preceded it, uh, So, it, which is verses 11 through 22 of chapter 2? So we got to determine which is this, what's for this reason, what is it pointing at? Is it cataphoric, meaning it's going backwards to verses 11 through 22 of chapter 2, and that's the basis for Paul's prayer in verses 14 to the end of the chapter, or is it verses 2 through 13, which follows it? And is that serving as the basis for Paul's second intercessory prayer, which begins in verse 14? So uh, this is what we're going to do. So you might say, and I like to do this for people who uh, have never been taught like this, okay? You know, uh, God says in his word, we're to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, strength. Heart, soul, and mind are up here. In other words, God wants you to use your mind that God, he gave you. And so we have a lot of dumbing down of Christianity today. In our country, we have the dumbing down in America with television and the uh, gaming and all that stuff, and people are uh, being very passive and they don't use their minds. It's very difficult for them even to sit through an hour Bible class, yet they can sit there passively watching Netflix all night. Which, why? Because I make you think. 
And if you're teaching a guy who's worth his salt in teaching, he's going to make you think. And so before we can talk about what the text means to us, we need to know what the text says. And, and so that's, we need to know, we need to interpret it. So not only am I going to uh, give you my reasons as to why, what this phrase is pointing to, and thus what is the basis of the second intercessory prayer. Uh, I, I'm not only doing that, but I'm also trying to teach you uh, at the same time, kill two birds with one stone, how to interpret. Now, you don't have to be a Greek or Hebrew scholar. You could, if, you're, if you're not, no big deal. Most people are not. So what you need to do, you get these modern translations, and you can benefit from great scholarship and those modern translations, whether it's the NIV, today's NIV, NRSV, ESV, Net Bible, great, great translations. We're so blessed here in this country with uh, the, the translations that we have. Uh, but uh, but you, what we need to understand also is that we need to know what it, the text says. We need to, uh, we interpret the Bible. Uh, we compare scripture with scripture. We don't build a doctrine or a teaching out of one verse like the cults do and false teachers. Uh, we also go back to original languages. If you can't, you don't, you don't know Greek or Hebrew, uh, then uh, you got the modern translations you can do. I go back to the original language because that's my job. And so I try to bring out things that the translators can't bring out because uh, it would uh, not it would uh, hurt the readability of the translation. So I can do that because I'm your interpreter. But also we we also uh, study the Bible in its historical context and with a literary context. And uh, so these are all different things uh, that we need to know and do uh, when we study the Bible because the Bible is written in different uh, different literary genres, apocalyptic language, uh, narratives, poems. Uh, poetry, all types of things. Uh, so we, and then we have the epistle, which we're working on. So you need to know that if you're going to really interpret accurately the Bible. Once we know what the text says, and what the, and what I mean by that, what is the authorial intent, they call it, in scholarly circles. What that means is, what did the original audience understand the author to be saying? Okay, what was his intent? And uh, so now, once we know what that is, then we can start talking about what it means to us. What's great about this book, which makes it easy really to teach, like a lot of the epistles of Paul and John and Peter, is that it's written to church age believers, you and I. So like I, I just finished off a book, Habakkuk, at Doctrinal Bible Church. Well, you know, it's a little more of a challenge to find the application for Habakkuk when he's not writing, the writer of Habakkuk is writing in the 6th century, 7th century BC, and he's not writing to church age believers like us. But this, you know, if you go listen and listen, we did it at Winston Bible Ministries. If you listen to me teach that book, oh, there's plenty of application in these Old Testament books. And so remember the early church, the early church, their Bible was the Old Testament. Before the completed, before the completed canon of Scripture, before the New Testament was fully written, who do you think their Bible was? <laughs> the Old Testament. And if they were Greek, they had the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. So, uh, let's look at, uh, so if, if, if you look at verse 1 in the, in, the, uh, in the Net Bible, let's go back here to verse 1. It says, in verse 1, it says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, and, and right there, starting in verse 2, he breaks it off, that thought, and you would think he's going to go into the prayer, but he doesn't. He resumes what he says in, in verse 1 and verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. Then he goes and presents his intercessory prayer on behalf of the recipients of the letter. So we want to know what is uh, that uh, the, the what is what is for this reason referring to. But before we do that, we need to understand something what we're looking at here in Ephesians in, in context. We noted in our introduction that Ephesians is divided into two main sections, and I, I mentioned this in passing this morning already. Ephesians chapters one through three actually call, are called the, uh, contain the indicatives of the faith, while, uh, while on the other hand, chapters 4 through 6 contain the imperatives. In other words, uh, we have the propositions and the doctrines taught in the first three chapters, and then verses four, chapters 4 through 6 are the application of these, this, this doctrine that was taught in the first three chapters. So therefore, this would mean that chapters 4 through 6 presents the practical application of the first three chapters and the prologue or preface of the letter which appears as we pointed out Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 14. So there are also, and I've also mentioned this in passing and in other places when we did the first prayer and in our introduction, there are also two magnificent intercessory prayers offered by Paul to the Father 
for the recipients of this letter. For those we did, we did the doctrine of prayer at Winston Bible Ministries when I was in Massachusetts not too long ago, couple, uh, coming up with three years ago. It's on our website, 37 Hours. And there's a written arg- article on uh, prayer that I have. It's called The Productive Prayer Life. It's under our written library uh, and under uh, The Spiritual Life. It's also on our Acad- Academia EDU website. And it's long. And I go into the, we went into in that article and also when we taught this class on prayer, uh, we, we went into the intercessory prayers of Paul. We talked about this one. And so one of the things, the great thing about learning this prayer is going to be we can apply it in our own life. We, we should pray the, for the things that Paul was praying. Pray for ourselves and our fellow believers in Christ. So we see again that there were there are two magnificent intercessory prayers uh, offered by Paul to the Father for the recipients of this letter. Now the first appears, as we pointed out, we studied in great detail, in chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. And the, this particular first intercessory prayer serves as a hinge to, to chapters 2 and 3. And its purpose is for the recipients of the letter to gain understanding regarding the contents of the first two chapters. And now the second intercessory prayer uh, for the recipients of this letter appears in Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. And it serves also as a hinge. But this time, uh, this second intercessory prayer is a hinge to the final three chapters. And it presents the practical application of the first three chapters. Now, in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul teaches the Christian community regarding the mystery of Christ, which is that the Gentile believers are fellow heirs with Jewish believers, fellow members of the body of Christ, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. That's in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 3. Paul also teaches in verses 7 through 11 that the Father's plan was accomplished through His Son. And then in verse 12, he says the believer now, the church-age believer, has confident access to the Father in prayer because of their union and identification with Jesus Christ. And then in verses 14 through 21, Paul asserts that he prayed to the Father on behalf of the recipients of this letter who are Gentile Christians in the Roman province of Asia, that Christ would dwell in the hearts of the Christian community in that Roman province of Asia and that they would know experientially the Lord Jesus Christ's love for each and every one of them. And that's important, people, because we love because he first loved us. You know, it says, love one another as Christ has loved you. So the more... The Holy Spirit, remember Ephesians, uh, Romans 5, 5, the Holy Spirit is pour- through the communication of the Word of God, which He's inspired. He is pouring out into our hearts the love of God and, and, and manifested through the person and work of the Son and the Holy Spirit at our justification. So uh, the more we learn about how God loves us, the more of a capacity we gain to love our fellow human beings and our fellow members of the body of Christ. Remember John 13, 34, 15, 12. Jesus said twice to his disciples on the night he was betrayed and the night before he went to the cross, love one another as I have loved you. And there's there's different manifestations of that if you're doing that. You forgive people because God in Christ has forgiven you. You've been patient and tolerant with one another. Your brothers and sisters in Christ as God in Christ has been with you and is with you. So in other words, because the way he treated me when I was his enemy, when I was dead in my sins and transgressions and raising, raising me up and seating me with His Son, Jesus Christ, through the baptism of the Spirit of my justifications, Ephesians 2, 6, and also sending His Son to the cross for me to, to suffer the wrath of God in my place so that I wouldn't suffer forever the lake of fire. The more I understand that and the more I get that and think about that and dwell upon that and accept it by faith, then I'll be able to love like the great saints like Paul and love like our Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's why I love, you need to know how much God loves you in order to develop the capacity to love the way God has commanded you and I to love. So in Ephesians 3, 1, we have in the original text the genitive neuter singular form of the immediate demonstrative pronoun hutos, which is translated this, for this reason, this. And so uh, the referent, what this word's referring to, this, for this reason, this is pointing, as I said before, to the contents of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. This is indicated by the fact that this word is put in the neuter gender, indicating the writer is not referring to a particular word that's uh, in the uh, masculine or feminine gender, and, uh, but rather it's, in, it's, in the, uh, it's put in the neuter gender because it's referring to the entire contents of this section of Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. So in other words, uh, to repeat, this word, this, hutos, 
is referring to the contents of Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, and that's indicated by the fact that this word is put in the neuter gender, uh, indicating that the writer is not referring to a particular word in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, but rather the entire contents of this pericope. Now, the genitive neuter singular form of this word is the object of the prep improper preposition, harin, which always appears after its object and it can express either purpose or cause. Here, it's a marker of reason, indicating, and that's what the translations have it as, indicating that the contents of Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 are the basis or the reason for Paul's intercessory prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. It doesn't function as a marker of purpose, which would indicate that the contents of Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 are the purpose for which Paul intercedes and pray to the Father on behalf of the recipients of this letter. And this is indicated, the fact that it's not a marker of purpose is indicated by the fact that these verses, Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, are not an object or an end to be attained or the intended result of Paul communicating this mystery of Christ. Or in other words, what I'm telling you is Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 does not constitute the intended result of Paul communicating this mystery because in Ephesians 3, 2, he asserts that the reason why he communicates this mystery, i.e. the gospel, is that the Father gave him this stewardship to do this. So rather, this word is a, a marker of cause, this improper prep preposition, hiring, uh, which is right here, and that's the transliteration in the, the, the Greek uh, uh, word. And so we see that the contents of Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 are actually the, serve as the basis for Paul intercessing, interceding in prayer on behalf of these Christians in the Roman province of Asia who were the recipients of this letter. And the reason why is because these verses constitute, the new, uh, describe for us, the new humanity, which along with Jesus Christ will rule over the works of God's hands during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So therefore, the expression in the Greek text, tutu harin, which is translated correctly by your translations and myself is for this reason, is what we call anaphoric, or some like to use the word anaphoric to pronounce it that way. It's anaphoric, meaning it's pointing backwards to verses 11 through 22 of chapter 2, and it's not cataphoric, pointing to verses 2 through 13. And so again, this expression, for this reason, is anaphoric rather than cataphoric, which means that the former is pointing to the immediate preceding context, and specifically the contents of Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, which these verses, as we pointed out, serve as the basis for the intercessory prayer in Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. Now, the latter means that it's pointing, if it was cataphoric, that means it would be pointing forward to the contents of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 through 13, which is autobiographical and a digression. Specifically, as I said, it's a digression and that Paul, in verses 2 through 13, does not communicate his intercessory prayer on behalf of the recipients of this letter until verses 14 to 21. And he does this deliberately in order to remind them that he's a communicator of the mystery of Christ, which he also identifies as the gospel in Ephesians 3, 7. Paul is interrupting, interrupting himself and digressing in order to provide the reader with more insight into the church as a mystery and his responsibility to communicate this mystery to the Gentiles. He describes it as a mystery because it was not known to Old Testament prophets, but has now been revealed by the Spirit through the teaching of the apostles and specifically himself. And in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 through 6, as we just read, and we'll study in detail, he defines this mystery by asserting that Gentile believers are fellow heirs with Jewish believers, fellow members of the body of Christ, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. Then in verses 7 through 11, as we'll see, he asserts that the Father's eternal plan was accomplished through His Son. And then in verse 12, as we pointed out a few moments ago, He teaches that the believer has confident access to the Father in prayer because of their union and identification with Jesus Christ. And then lastly, in verse 13, He asks the recipients of this letter to not lose heart because of His imprisonment, which was for their glory. And we'll talk about what that means when we get to it. So therefore, the contents of Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, could not possibly be the basis for the digression in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 through 13. Why? Because the church, composed of both Jewish and Gentile Christian communities, and permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit, is not the reason 
why Paul has a stewardship to communicate the mystery of Christ. Ephesians 3, 2, Paul says there, uh, he, that verse presents the reason why he possesses this stewardship, and he says it's because the Father gave it to him. Rather, the contents of Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 are actually the basis for Paul's intercessory prayer recorded in Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. Lastly, this phrase, for this reason, tutu harin, which appears in verse 1 and also in verse 14, indicates that Paul is resuming his thought, which began in Ephesians 3, 1, and interrupted with an autobiographical digression in Ephesians 3, 2 through 13. So when you see in Ephesians 3, uh, 14, for this reason, and then he goes on to the prayer, right? Well, he uses that same phrase, for this reason, in verse 1. However, as we can see, he doesn't immediately talk about the prayer because he has this autobiographical digression, which is really brilliant, okay? Because he's using the, he's using the figure of Anacluthon, which he's already done it in chapter 2, as we'll see in a second. So, so when you see for this reason in verse 14, he's basically saying, I'm resuming my thought now, guys. That's what he's doing. Now, let me tell you something. Um, some, you know, like uh, I remember, so Paul, you know, Paul is just, you know, you might say, well, Paul was wandering around and everything. No, he wasn't wandering around. Um, I remember one time when I first started teaching, I was at GVC where I go to Dane, and a friend of mine comes up to me, and she, a woman, and she says, uh, good, good friend, she says, you know, she started, she, what she, she was like saying, almost like I was uh, going on a tangent, okay? She said, you're going on a tangent. I said, no, I'm not. I mean, I, I, there's a reason why I went to I, where I went. So, for instance, when I'm teaching, I teach on something, right? If you know, look at my notes, okay? I tell people this all the time. I have, I have a program. I, my notes are five pages, tops, okay? And that's about 10, 15 minutes of speaking. If I just read normal speed, okay? If I, read, if I speak like Massachusetts people fast, uh, it's probably like in uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> now, the rest of the class is all extemporaneously up here. Now, with my mind, because the way I study and way I, I, I think it outlines. So I can hit a, a point and I can digress from that and just talk about that, explain it, and then come right back around to the point. That's what Paul does. A lot of people do that. A lot of guys do that. And uh, a lot of people do that. And so it's it's not because I've lost my train of thought and I'm just wandering around. If you go back and listen to what I'm saying, I was actually developing something so that in explaining it in greater detail and then coming back to what we were talking about. Paul does that. People do that all the time. You don't even, the Bible teachers have done that throughout the centuries. I do it today. And and other people who, who do in public speaking, or you can say writing. You know, you do I, you do it in writing, you know. And so it's not it's it's not exactly uh, a sign that the person is like, uh, you know, demented or something, you know. It's really, it's a, it's actually in Paul's case, it's a, it's a sign of a brilliant mind under the influence of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's what it was. So uh, we see that uh, if you go back to my notes here, this is not the first time, as I said uh, briefly in passing, this is not the first time in Ephesians that Paul has begun a thought but breaks it off temporarily, but then resumes it again because he does this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Look, look, look at Ephesians 2, 1, please. Hold your place. Well, you're right in Ephesians. Go to Ephesians 2, 1. Ephesians 2, 1, and says, And although you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you formerly lived, according to the, this world's present path, according to the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the ruler of the spirit that is now energizing the sons of disobedience, among whom all of us also formerly lived out our lives in the cravings of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, okay, what is it? Finally finishes. Even though we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you were saved, and he raised us up with him. Uh, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus to demonstrate in the coming ages the surpassing wealth of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So he, he begins the thought in verse 1 and then develops that, what he said there. But then if you notice when he gets to verse 5, he, he says, even though we were dead in transgressions, which is what he said in verse 1, now he's going to complete his thought because he wanted to develop something uh, about the pre-conversion justification state of the recipients of this letter who are church age believers like you and I. All right, so if you look at, uh, again, my notes, as we just read, Paul's thought 
in Ephesians 2, 1, it was begun but not completed until Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, which thus creates what we call an anacoluthon. Uh, for those on the audio, A-N-A-C-O-L-U-T-H-O-N, anacoluthon. And you know, it's, it's, it's a figure of speech, and I like to bring figure of speeches out because it's an important interpretation. Good book to get. I would get for uh, great, uh, great, I still use it, uh, Basic Bible Interpretation by Roy Zuck. And he does a great job. There's other guys I have in my, just for hermeneutic, but he is a very, it's very readable and he really does a fantastic job. It's still a great book. I still use it from time to time as well. But uh, he'll talk about anacoluthon. What's that? Or hendiatus. You've heard me say that. Or ellipsis. Ellipsis. So the, I, I'll bring in met, metonymy. I bring out these figures that the biblical writers use and we use them actually in English. All languages use them. So uh, if we go back to my notes again, uh, we see that the thought begun in verse 1 of chapter 2 is not completed until Ephesians chapter 2 verses 5 and 6 which thus creates an anacoluthon and Ephesians chapter 2 verses 2 to 4 2, 2 to 4 and which means that there's a that all, anacoluthon means there's a break in the grammar he's not completing his thought and Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 the main verb and in, in the subject have not been mentioned until Ephesians 2 4 where the subject God the Father is mentioned the main verb is mentioned in Ephesians 2 5 which is soon uh, suzo poieto made alive together in verse 5. And Ephesians 2, 1 through 4 is one incomplete sentence. In order to leave the readers in suspense, he did it on purpose, to leave the readers in suspense as to how God the Father would solve the dilemma of the recipients of this letter, what they were in prior to their justification. To mark the resumption of this thought, Paul employs the same, as I pointed out to you a few moments ago, the same identical process of a concessive clause which appears in Ephesians 2, 1. So if you recall, in Ephesians 2, 5, the phrase ontas, hemas, nekrus, tois, para, po, uh, para, excuse me, para, pato, mason, which is translated, even though each and every one of you is a corporate unit with spiritually dead ones because of your transgressions. If you recall there, the only difference between the two is that the one in Ephesians 2, 1 employs the accusative plural form of the second personal pronoun su, which refers to the recipients of the epistle. On the other hand, in Ephesians 2, 5, he uses the word us, which is the first person plural form of the personal pronoun ego, which refers to Paul and the recipients of this letter. So therefore, the conjunction chi, as we pointed out in Ephesians 2, 5, introduces a concessive clause which resumes and completes the one it introduces in Ephesians 2, 1, but with a slight difference in subject. So therefore, the only reason why I went to the Ephesians 2 there is because to show you that Paul's using the figure of Cluthon already in the letter. And so therefore, in Ephesians 3, 4, 1 through 14, Paul once again employs the figure of Anacoluthon. And in Ephesians 3, 14, he marks the resumption of his thought by re repeating the same exact expression, tuto harin, for this reason, which begins Ephesians 3, 1. Thus, the evidence within Ephesians itself indicates that this expression, for this reason, in Ephesians 3, 1, is anaphoric rather than cataphoric. So therefore, as we close, this expression for this reason in Ephesians 3, 1 is pointing backward to the meeting, immediate preceding context and specifically the contents of Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, which talks about the new humanity composed of Jewish and Gentile church age believers. And that was going to serve as the basis for the intercessory prayer that we see in Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. So we just scratched the service and we're going to keep uh, forging ahead. We're going to have, um, move on in verse one and talk more about it, what's in the, in the contents of this uh, particular verse. And, uh, and also, if you look at this verse as we close, you know, he's talking about the basis for this intercessory prayer. And, but uh, before he talks, presents the intercessory prayer, which serves as a hinge to the next couple of chapters, now he goes into a digression as we point out, an autobiographical digression about his ministry, his stewardship of the mystery, the divine secret, which is what? Not known to Old Testament saints in the, in the past, but known to the, to the church, to the apostles and the New Testament prophets by the power of the Spirit. What's that? The Jewish and Gentile church age believers are co-heirs, co-partakers of the promise, of messianic promise, and co-members of the body of Christ because of their faith in Christ, their justification and union identification with him. And so that is incredible. That's who you and I are. We're special people, not because of who we are or what we've done, it's because of who Jesus is and what the Father and the Spirit and the Son done. 
Okay, at justification, when we trusted in Jesus as Savior, we didn't earn or deserve it. It's because of the merits of the object of our faith and our union identification with Christ, the merits of that, that the Father has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, made us members of the body of Christ, the future bride of Christ, and we're going to reign over this earth for a thousand years, dispossess Satan and the fallen angels who are our enemies right now as we speak. Read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. And so you need to and always remind yourself, that not only have you created in the image of God, but you're a child of God in union with Christ. When you make your prayer, you're seated at the right hand of the Father. You can't get any closer. You're in a place of power that's above Satan and the fallen angels. You don't want, you, I, I, who cares about being the richest person on earth? If you don't have Jesus, you don't have anything. You gain the world and lose the soul. I'd rather be, I'd rather be a, a, a proclaimer of the gospel in the church age, the mystery doctrine of the church age and a church age believer than the president of the United States or the, or the richest guy in the world and he could take all that money and that power. It doesn't mean anything. I get the money and the power because I'm in union with Christ who was the owner of a cattle on a thousand hills and so are you, okay? So we need to define ourselves by that and don't let your circumstances, we walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Not by our circumstances. We might be rich. We may be poor. Uh, whatever our financial situation, our social situation is, or we're going through a health crisis, or we're going through, we lost a loved one. You know, your husband ran away with his secretary, or your, your wife ran away with her girlfriend. I don't know. Whatever's going on, your, your kid became, he said, came up to you and he says he's gay. Uh, you got, you've lost your job after you had for 39 years. Uh, you, you're, 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 the world is a mess. The country is a mess. Who am I going to vote for? And how am I going to put my three kids through college? How am I going to pay the electric bill? All these stuff, our circumstances are trying to drag us down. Don't let it. Keep looking at to, to keep seeking the things above. Colossians 3, 1, 2, 5, right? Where Christ is, seat the right hand of God. Why? Because that's where you sit in a place of position and authority. So when you pray, think of that. Be aware of that. In fact, when you say, in Jesus' name, to close your prayer, you could actually say, Father, before you get going with the prayer, Father, I'm aware of the fact that I'm seated at your right hand. And you're answering this prayer not because of who I am, my merits, because of who your son is. And, my, and the merits of my union identification with him. Because your word says that when you look at me, you look at your son. Crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with him. So remember that, Christian, as you go out into this world, that the devil's world, who is your enemy, and that, you remember, uh, human, uh, human beings are not our enemy. The Democrats, the Republicans, the Independents, the Libertarians, the Chinese, the Russians, your husband, your wife, your pastor, your deacons, your congregation, they're not your enemy. People are not your, the enemy is an invisible enemy, Satan and the kingdom of darkness, who don't want you to know this stuff and try to persecute those who try to get that out, that message out. And they don't want you to know who you are in Christ Jesus because then you're a threat to them. Remember, we got a bunch of, with church, the members of the body of Christ, whether they realize it or not, we're a bunch of little Jesus rolling around. And the more you grow in your relationship with God, grow to maturity, become like Christ, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, then you're really being a huge problem for them. And y'all, that's the best thing you could do for America if you're a patriot. You know, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. You know what you can do for your country? Grow to spiritual maturity. Become a Christian who has an invisible hero with an invisible impact and is the reason why. Hey, the rapture can't happen because uh, the church is still here. Second, Tim Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And the, we, that means we, we're the salt of the earth. We are holding off the rapture from happening as because the church, the spirit working through the church, and as we grow to maturity, the, the, we're, we're, we're hindering evil from proliferating, okay? So you're the soul, the church is the solution, the gospel, and the church living the gospel and proclaiming the gospel is the solution to the problems in America today. And any country on the face of the earth always has been the solution because the problems of mankind in the country, in all the countries, are Satan, his cosmic system, and the sin nature, which we all have. Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3. Okay? That's the problem. And the only way to solve that problem is with divine power, which was manifested through the crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, session of the right hand of the Father, which delivered us from the wrath of God, uh, Satan and his cosmic system, enslavement to the sin nature, physical and spiritual death, personal sin, condemnation from the law. The power of God is in those events in Christ's life, which were manifested God's power. And now through the baptism of the Spirit and our justification, we're crucified, died, buried, raised, and seen with Christ. 
members of the body of Christ, the future bride of Christ. We're going to reign with Christ. We're going to be in the millennial reign, the new heavens and the new earth. This momentary light affliction is bearing, uh, producing in us a, 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 an eternal way to glory. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this class